Paranormal Dimensions is fortnightly on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. Any opinions or comments made by any guest are their own, and they do not necessarily reflect any of the presenters' or network's opinions. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. Uh, tell me, young man, <clears throat> what new reports are you getting on unidentified flying objects? Flying saucers? Oh, they keep coming in every once in a while, but we don't take them too seriously. Oh, no? This is Nick Pope, and you're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, the UK's biggest paranormal network. And this is Paranormal Dimensions with David Young. Hello and welcome to the show. In fact, this is the last show before Christmas. Thank you for that intro, Nick. Today's guest is a man named Mark Dalton. He's a friend of mine. Uh, he's actually run the uh, South End UFO group for around 20 years. Um, they also do all sorts of other paranormal uh, investigations. But um, it should be hopefully interesting to you. As always, before we start the show, uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me at any time, my email address is davidyoung2qn at yahoo.co.uk. That's davidyoung2qn at yahoo.co.uk. Right, okay. Now, as I said, um, today's guest is Mark Dalton. As I said, he's uh, run the um, the South End Essex UFO group for 20 years. So I hope you'll enjoy the show. Mark has got some interesting stories to tell. Hello, Mark. Welcome to the show. Hello. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Good. I think we'd better tell our listeners... Um, you only live around the corner. We only live about three minutes away from each other. But uh, but um, for for convenience sake, it's easier to do it like this, the recording. So um, now let's, let's do a little bit of intro for you. This is Mark Dalton. He's actually run the uh, South End UFO group. They're now South End in Essex for our international um, listeners in the UK. Um, so tell us a little bit about your investigations, Mark, as a UFO investigator for over 20 years. Um, and and for the South End UFO group, what first got you into the subject? Well, um, South End UFO group, firstly, has been going for quite a few years. It was started off by a lady called Maxine in South End, and uh, we used to have um, quite a good number of people come along to events. We put on a conference in South End that had over 250 people um, one year with some good speakers, um, and it's been going for quite a few years now, and uh, there's still a few of us like diehards that run the group and uh up, up until covid we were having public meetings every every month oh don't mention week. that word covid yeah go on <laughs> uh, yeah yeah um andy collins um from uh, ancient aliens and uh, the author was a regular he lives local um yeah. regular of our, our, our events plus we had lots of different speakers really cutting across the paranormal and ufo subject mm. uh, so we, we're still going strong we plan to have some meetings um, starting uh, January or February next year again, and just see what kind of numbers we get. Because unfortunately, with the COVID, it has stopped and uh, reduced people from going to, to events. Yeah. Um, and and I, and I think it's going to continue until people uh, get confident that they're they're going to be safe going to, to meetings. So I started in the subject uh, um, in the days in the in the seventies when I was a, a young kid. I was fishing off a South End pier. And uh, I was kind of what you call a latchkey kid. And that was I'd be out as soon as it was light and I had a bit of breakfast and I'd be out all day. Parents usually didn't know where I was and I'd come home when it was dark. And I think that was probably the same for a lot of kids in the 70s. And uh, I, one of my 
uh, hobbies was fishing. And I was fishing off uh, South End Pier, which is, uh, the, I think it still is the longest pleasure pier in the world. And uh, I'd be regularly fishing off there with friends, sometimes on my own, and uh, spend many, many an hour um, fishing. And this particular day, it was, it was getting dark. It was a lovely sunny day. Um, the light was starting to diminish. And uh, at the time, I wasn't really interested in UFOs. I mean, I watched all the usual programs in the 70s, the Jerry Anderson programs, but I wouldn't say I, wouldn't say I was actually into UFOs as such. And an orange ball of light appeared um, in front of me as I was facing, funny enough, where we live, Canby Island. Um, and it hovered there. It just remained motionless. And at first, I didn't pay much attention to it and carried on fishing and then looked up and it moved and it was still stationary. Um, now, this time of the, the night, the pier closed, I think it used to close about 10 or 11 o'clock. And it probably was about nine, half nine, because it was starting to get dark. It was a summer's evening. And um, <clears throat> I looked up again after about five minutes and the ball had disappeared. And I looked to my left and to my right and then to my left it appeared and it was to the, towards the pier head. But the distance that it had covered uh, was a little bit odd because it was quite a distance. I mean, how did it get over there? That's quite a distance to cover in, you know, four or five minutes. Um, so I was just mm. glancing up at it now and again, just like not really paying a lot of attention, but it was just there. Um, so I thought, oh, it's, it's now over to my left. It's covered a, a big difference from, from right to left. And um, again, carried on. More interest in catching fish than was anything else. And then I looked up again, and there it is above me. And in the stationary position. So at this point, I'm thinking, well, that, that's really, really odd because that just moved from there in a few seconds, which is, not, there's nothing that can move that fast. So at this point, I noticed that my dad was walking down towards the pier, obviously concerned that I was out probably a bit longer than I should have been. And uh, I, I said to him, look at that light up there. And he didn't even look. This is the thing. In those days, in the 70s, if you admitted to seeing a UFO or anything like that, the first word, it's not overly politically correct, but you were called a nutter. Yeah, I know the feeling. Um, yeah. UFOs didn't exist. They were all in people's minds. And as a kid, I think I was about nine or ten, and I was asking a lot of questions. You know, what was it I saw? You know, it wasn't a plane. I mean, it's too, it, it, it didn't, orange balls of light, you know, just don't just remain motionless and then move and zip across the sky and then move back and remain motionless. So no one actually gave me any answer and because, you know, what kids are like, they're quite inquisitive and uh, and I would be asking questions and asking questions, but no, it's, you know, you're going to get called a nutter if you keep, keep mentioning about UFOs. Mm. And that's what sparked the interest. You know, I wanted to know what it was that I'd seen. Now in the, and I did have the actual press cutting from the local newspaper, which is a South End Evening Echo, and um, the, the Coast Guards had also seen this orange ball of light Zipping about the uh, South End Estuary, because South End lies um, on the on the, the banks of the River Thames, just a little bit further down from London, where it um, from, from goes from river into sea, and it's quite reasonably wide. It's, mm. it's an estuary. Yeah, you got Kent one UFOs side and Essex the other side, didn't you? Just for our, our... yeah, yeah, and, and UFOs have been seen historically going back um, years. I think there was a, an RAF pilot in the fifties. I think he's called his name Saladin. I might have got that wrong, but anyway, he was an RAF pilot, ex World War II, and he um, admitted to seeing some discs over the Thames estuary, um, which and to, and to actually report it was quite brave in those days. Mm. Um, and he was flying a, a Meteor um, a aircraft at the time, and they were in his windscreen. He saw them very clearly. He reported them, um, and in those days, to actually say that you'd seen something like that was quite quite a brave thing to do. So there'd been reports of UFOs um, going back many years over the estuary and probably like the Germans in World War II, um, the Thames was quite an easy river to spot from high up and used to navigate. I mean, it's mm. quite quite common for pilots to use rivers and estuaries to, to navigate. And since then, um, I got involved in the South and UFO group many years ago and carried out some investigations. And subsequently trips to Rendlesham Forest plus sky watches. So right across the subject, um, investigated some quite interesting UFO reports. 
had more sightings, both personally and, and with witnesses. So it's, um, it's been a long journey um, and quite an interesting one. Mm. That orange light, um, you know, it brings back my memory. Of, uh, mine was an orange light, to be honest. That was back in 60s, I think it was 67, going across. I think I told you, didn't I? It was a, it was a big oval object going across the sky. And I've mentioned it a few times on this show. But uh, do you know, how big was that, um, what you saw, do you think? Is there any idea of um, how big it was? I've got to be honest, I was I was about nine or ten, and um, I, I couldn't... The, the thing is, I can still... If you've had a, a UFO, I, I've, I've got this thing. If, you if you've had a, a UFO experience, it does imprint on your mind. Now, bear mm. in mind, um, it was quite a few years ago when I was nine or ten and when I saw that object. But every UFO sighting I've had, it's like it imprints on your, on your mind. Mm. So but as regards to size, it's difficult. Um, it was as large as a, a small plane. Um, and it was if I was looking from the pier towards the west, it would be over where we're living. In actual right. fact. It would over Canby. So, so, so was it, could you judge how high it was? and um, Or was you sort of just guessing? Because, I mean, it could have been any size, couldn't it? The, the, depending on how high it is, if you can't tell how high it is, it's hard to tell us because uh, it's the one I saw. I'm mean, not going to go by that. It looked like a large object, but I didn't, and it looked like it was in the same sort of area that a plane would fly. But it was very yeah. difficult to tell exactly how high it was and everything, and the way it was going across the sky. It was going quite fast, probably about a, a bit faster than an aeroplane. Um, now the one I saw was like a, all different shades of orange. It was like it wasn't a very bright orange, like a light. It was like an incandescent orange. That's, I think I'll describe it to you like that. Was that kind of the same as what you saw? This this was, uh, I would say, a, like a, a basketball orange, a dull orange colour. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, you do question yourself. You do question your sightings and you do. Um, I've, I've had a pretty explosive UFO sighting that was a few years ago. But with this particular one, after a period of time, we didn't really see that. And then when you see the newspaper report from the 70s, mm. the Coast Guard's seen exactly the same thing. Now, believe you me, the Coast Guards know what light should be above the Thames and what shouldn't be. And, you know, they, they're used to keeping a watch. Sure. Um, yeah. And uh, I think I've still got the press cutting somewhere, and it might, be on, um, it might be on the Facebook page that we've got. I think I might have put it on there. But, you know... It, it, the, Thames, the Thames has always been a bit of a hotspot for UFOs. And when, when I've done talks to local groups, um, you know, you, you ask the audience, you know, did they want to report any sightings of anyone? Has anyone ever seen anything interesting? And uh, you might get the odd one or two hands go up. But then as soon as you finish the event, there's usually a queue of people wanting to tell you because they didn't yeah. want to put their hand up. Yeah, people don't like to talking. Oh, I've had, I've and, felt uh, like that myself, so I know I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. sometimes people aren't confident in, in talking about it in front of other people, but when you've got a one-to-one -one with them, it's like they can't wait to tell their story. Mm. Quite mm. often, their stories involve <clears throat> um, seeing objects over or near the Thames, um, the River Thames. So um, there was a, there is there's a lot of theories why um, at the very mouth of the River Thames, a place called Foulness. Um, you've got what used to be called the AWRE, which is the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment. And again, it was rumoured in the 70s and 80s that the Russians had a keen interest in what was going on there. But also there was a, a, an unusual number of UFO sightings around that area. So, and, and again, rumours of uh, laser weapons being tested in the 70s over there and lots of lots of things going on. It's It's... It's a, a secretive um, island that um, two parts are secure. One part is extremely secure. Can't get anywhere near it. So um, whether there's still stuff going on there, you know, I don't know, but it's still very secure. Um, yeah, you can only get onto the island with a pass. Mm -hmm. um, and there's still um, UFO reports right up to the present day from around Shoebury, which is close to it. And certainly Great Waping, which is next to it. Yeah. Did they used to do a lot of uh, military training there? I remember going to some of these beaches and uh, you could find lot like, um, shell cartridges and things all over the place. Or was that something different? Yeah. I mean, it's now run by a company called Kinetic and they the, the army still test ordnance there. So 
in fact, my when I lived in the Great Wake with my next door neighbour, that was part of his job <clears throat> was to test ordnance because it's obviously got to be safe mm. um, for, for, for it to be used when out in the, any conflict. And that's what they were doing. They regularly fire out to sea with quite loud bangs and booms. And um, but yeah, that's where they test. And I think they also destroy some of the ordnance over there as well. Yeah. No, I was just wondering because you know, if there was army about, would would they have seen anything? Was there any sort of military reports that you know of? Well, um, I was talking to Nick Redfern one day, um, the author. He's written quite a few good books on UFOs. Yeah, he's been on the and show. He, yeah, he he did mention that he uh, he found a report from a policeman from the sixties of a UFO sighting over Falness. All right. And uh, he said it's one he's not going to forget because the officer's name was P.C. Crook. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> that goes. Yeah, he, he kind of, that's one that stuck out in his mind because uh, obviously when he, he came and did a talk at uh, one of our conventions and, um, yeah, that was quite interesting. But there's been, there's been um, reports all, all along the coast, but, but an awful lot around that area, mm. which is quite coincidental when you think this. There is secret stuff going on over Falness. Yeah. I must say, since I've been living back here, I haven't seen anything yet. Although maybe I'm not looking hard enough. But uh, I, I have heard from somebody living over here at Canby. I don't know if you know him. But he says there's quite a lot of activity that he sees. Um, he lives on one of the boats, actually, over the boat yard. Boat yard. I'll have to try and um, get him on the show one day. I did, he did say he would come on sometime, but I haven't seen much of him. So, but um, Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is... There is um... I mean, there's, there's been, uh, I mean, Canby's been quite a, a good uh, hotspot in the past. Mm. Thomas Shoebury, South End, most of most of the towns, uh, and also Hanningfield Reservoir is. Um, I had a guy contact me uh, one day and said, "I've got some footage my son took. Um, I don't know what it is. Can you come and have a look?" I'm like, "Yeah, sure." So I got around to see him, and uh, basically, it's a, a, a ball of light that's whizzing around in the sky. As you know, the the kind of I suppose stereotypical white balls zipping around as they do, yeah. doing maneuvers that would pulp a human body due to the g forces, and um, and in this footage you can hear a plane coming into the airspace, and as the plane comes into the airspace, this white ball of light comes towards the camera, and then you, you get kind of like a a, a a red kind of type of interference that that goes across the screen yeah. so so we've got that footage it's quite interesting and i showed it to um, a local astronomer and he had uh, in fact an expert astronomer moiston dean of the hawkwell observatory you know, he certainly knows his stuff he's been doing it for years and i said what do you think this is and he had absolutely no idea it freaked him out a little bit but he had no idea what it was and um it's quite an interesting bit of footage. You know, you can see the object clearly zipping around in the sky. Then you hear the aircraft coming into the airspace and then it comes towards the camera and it disappears. But it kind of does this wave of interference that goes across the phone screen, which you can clearly see. So it's like, well, what's caused that? Whatever it did, mm. it moved and it's caused that interference. Now, the interesting thing about this particular sighting was it wasn't too far from Hanningfield Reservoir. And Hanningfield Reservoir has been... Um, over the years, a regular spot for UFO reports. Um, whether it's got anything to do, you know, you've got a reservoir, you've got plenty of fresh water there, um, but it does seem certain areas and locations seem to have more than the average amount of UFO reports. Hmm, interesting. I think that thing you said about astronomers, uh, you, you, you find astronomers don't like to admit too much about seeing weird things, do they? You know, that's what, that's well, what I've found. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Royston Dean, he's, uh, he's a guy that is quite open-minded. He's given a talk at one of our group meetings, and he's quite open-minded. I mean, he's, he, he's been in the, 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 the astronomy field for decades and decades, and uh, he runs the Hawkwood Observatory, and you know, quite, quite often he's get all his telescopes out for the general public and scout groups and that kind of thing, and he really, really does know his stuff. And he used to get reports from a group before the South End UFO group. Um, and he said he was just getting reports from that were obviously planes and obviously had lots mm, of explanations. Mm. And, uh, and when I kind of 
made sure that it, you know that he could have confidence that when when I run any reports past him, it was you know, these are genuine reports and we know what planes look like. We know what military flares and as the general astronomical events are that we can rule out most sightings. As, as you know, most UFO sightings can be logically explained. Mm. Um, he was quite happy to have a, have a look, and you know, occasionally I'd go over and pop over and see him. And um, he, he quite often gets UFO reports and um, sends them to us for, to, to investigate. Does he? That's right. <laughs> so, what sort of UFO sightings stand out to you as being good evidence, Mark? That's a good question. Um, well, if, if I can just list a few of the, of the objects I've seen, both with witnesses and uh, on my own. Um, I was following a car down towards Great Waping where I used to live, and there was two balls of light. Um, and the, the road is unlit, the main road that leads to, to Waping, which is semi rural village, it's unlit. You've got a couple of lights on this, on this about, I don't know, a couple of miles, maybe three miles uh, along this windy country road. And two balls of light, one slightly in front of the other, went from left to right, covered a huge amount of sky and ended up going over a place called Brickworks. Now, I knew the car in front of me must have seen, because I saw it as clear as anything. I know they must have seen what I saw. And these two, two white balls, they were like two white peppermints, like a dull white colour. And going from left to right, they reached a certain point and it was almost like someone flipped off a switch. And one went dink, dink, within a split second, the other one went out. And I always wondered, <clears throat> Do these objects have the ability to just open and close doorways to other dimensions, mm. which I think they did, and I'll tell you why for you know, regards to another site in a, in a second, or um, are they cloaking themselves so that they can't be seen? Mm. Um, now, I, what was quite interesting about that report was the person who, or the people who were in that car um, very, very obviously saw what I saw. And I thought, let's see if they report what they've seen. They never did, never had any reports, never had anything, which which you could not have not seen what, what happened in front of us. Two cars going along the country road, these is two balls of light, went at good speed from left to right, reached a certain point, and both clicked out. Now, about a mile away from, uh, maybe a couple of miles away from waking to a place called Shubrin S, um, I was out fishing one day and the boat was going out to sea. So I was facing the shore um, as we headed out to sea and a white ball of light appeared um, not overly high above these houses. And I thought, what's an odd, odd white ball of light? What's that doing there? I thought it might be a balloon. And then the speed that it disappeared from right to left was incredible. So I followed it at, at uh, an incredible speed from right to left. Half past seven in the morning, very clear, nice sun's day, no cloud. And it kind of arced out to sea, turned from a white to a yellowy, goldeny type colour. And then like a black shutter came across it and it disappeared. Um, and again, did that enter a doorway or did that then cloak it to, because it disappeared, it completely disappeared. So that's, that's two sightings I've had in, the, in that area. Um, we went to Rendlesham Forest, uh, about five of us from the UFO group. We go there quite regularly and do sky watches. And, um, you know, we have a bite to eat in one of the local pubs and uh, have a chat. And uh, normally, normally <clears throat> stay there till the wee hours. We've met many groups in Rendlesham Forest over the years. Um, Larry Warren and Brenda Butler and all of the big names. Oh, big um, names, yeah. Oh. Turn up. <laughs> your, your friend, Larry Warren. <laughs> anyway, talking yeah, I don't, about I don't really want to talk too much about him, but there you go. <laughs> and I've got to mention him, he's actually part of this story. Yeah, yeah, no, he, I understand that. He was due to be in the, I mean, we're going back quite a few years. Yeah, when everyone when thought he, it was genuine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was in the forest, or was due to be in on track 12 in the forest. So there was four of us uh, regulars to the group and a new guy that he'd never been before and he wanted to come on a sky watch. And we went to a place called The Bench, which is a slightly elevated position in the forest, um, overlooking um, the farmhouse, the famous farmhouse that uh, um, has, has been noted as being part of the Rendlesham Forest incident. So we did something we, I don't think we tried too often and we'd, we'd heard about it um, uh, Stephen Greer um, 
doing meditations and trying to just see what happens doing a meditation and seeing if we could attract anything. So we, we stood in a circle on the, on the hill, the bench, and uh, we did a 10 minute meditation. And once we'd finished, we turned around and literally as we turned around, we kind of formed a line <clears throat> overlooking the trees and the farmhouse and these, to me, three balls of golden white light just appeared. It didn't fly in from left to right, up or down. They just literally appeared out of the darkness. So you can imagine we're then looking at each other with the, what the, I won't mm. use the expletives, as you can imagine. And it's like, we're looking at each other. Are you seeing that? And it's like, yeah, yeah. And, and everyone was stunned. I've got to be honest, we were stunned. And uh, they lasted, I don't know, maybe a minute and a half, two minutes, but we all saw them. And then just as they materialized out of the darkness, they kind of like just disappeared and sucked the light back into, into blackness to a point of nothing. So we're like, oh my God. And like literally, we were like jumping up and down. Like, Do you, we, we couldn't believe it. We were actually speechless at first. Now, the interesting thing is, <clears throat> and this is what's quite odd. Um, I know I saw three objects. I know another guy saw three objects. Another guy, uh, Paul, who's been a regular of the group since, uh, not from day one, but pretty much from day two. And he comes on many sky watches and um, quite often drunk and escapades down at the barge in when we're <laughs> hunting, looking at crop circles. Um, but he saw, I think, five objects. Now, that I find really interesting. We were all looking at exactly the same thing over the horizon above the, uh, the farmhouse just to the left. Um, yet we didn't all see the same thing. Mm. But we were all looking at the same thing. So that has been a puzzle um, for a long time. Now, <clears throat> believe it or not, there was five of us and three of us had video cameras that night. Um, but what happened, we did one sky watch. Um, we went back to the car and then said, well, you know, still, it's not too late. It's about 12 o'clock. Let's do one more sky watch for a little while and then we'll go home. Now, it's, it's pitch black at Rendlesham Forest. You used to be able to park, not in the car park, but just by the side of the road. Mm. So unbeknown to each other, we'd all put our camera bags, because we didn't anticipate doing a long watch, we'd all put our camera bags back in the car, then went back down to the bench and did the second sky watch and did the meditation. And I've always wondered, would they have appeared if we'd had our cameras? I don't know. But that wasn't the first incident that happened at um, the bench area. We were there another time with a lot more people, and we did a we did a, a, a meditation again, um, and then said, "Well, look, okay, we've been here a little while. Let's um, let's go into track twelve because that's where Larry Warren Warren is going to be." And we thought we'd meet up with him there, and I think Brenda Butler was in the forest as well. So we thought we'd go and meet up with another another group <clears throat> uh, that we thought would be down around track track twelve. Um, and as we left, we did the meditation, as we left the bench, <clears throat> it was like a um, when you had lightning, but no lighting, the clouds are just bursting with energy and, and lighting up. But the odd thing was, it only seemed to be above the bench area. And I remember saying to the guy, well, that's weird. I've never seen lightning. It's just over, like, over our heads and nowhere else. <laughs> so off we've gone to in the darkness um, to, to track 12, try to, uh, to try and meet up and catch up with Larry and Brenda, couldn't find them. So we wandered back. As we wandered back, we bumped into John Hansen. And he said, oh, he said, I've just come from the bench. Have you? Yeah. And he had some, <laughs> yeah. what is quite good, unusual. It's on, it used to be on YouTube, but I've not noticed it on there. I'm looking for it the other day, but he, he took some good footage. So basically, as we wandered out of the, the bench area, he must have been a few minutes behind us and he wandered into the bench area then saw this ufo filmed it it's on youtube uh, john hansen's ufo footage um and it's like well i wonder if that that strange cloud lightning whatever it was was responsible for that ufo appearing because it seemed quite coincidental mm. um, did the meditation the Stephen being meditation type thing have anything to do with it i don't know but he filmed the object and we were a little bit gutted that we'd missed it 
um because we'd all wandered off to try and find brenda and larry white uh, <laughs> but yeah that was that's that's a multiple witness sighting um uh, with with a group and the the new guy that came along on his first guy watch never came back it freaked really? him out so much that once all, he never came back so did um you did meet up with Larry and, and Brenda in the end. Now, did they see anything? Did they say anything about seeing anything? No, I don't think we actually saw them the whole night. The thing is, the, the, oh. as you know, that the, um, you'll get some people that, that that will kind of do their their watch and they're wandering down track 12 and some on track 10, and some on yeah. the other track. Um, and you can literally wander that forest and just not meet anyone. Oh, right, and yeah, it's, that, it's big enough here to do that. You wouldn't... Yeah. Um, and, uh, and they were there, but we didn't see them. And yeah. um, we ended up going home, but they, they were there somewhere. Yeah, you'd only have to, like you say, with, um, with John Hansen and that, you was only probably a couple of minutes away from each other, but you didn't see each other. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and he took... And, he, and the good thing is he, he took some footage of what, you know, it's quite good, odd, unusual... I, I know uh, it's a, like a three or four lights, I think, that all kind of come on or disappear, and then an odd shape. I, God knows what it is, but it, it certainly appeared, and he filmed it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you consider the Rendlesham event um, a genuine event in your own mind? When I say <laughs> well, when I say genuine event, we you you know, I mean, it happened over three nights, and um, obviously something happened. <laughs> But I'm just wondering if you think it was a genuine UFO event. If you go by the eyewitness reports, I mean, I, I uh, very much on the sceptical side of the subject. Um, I'm not one of these that believes anything and everything. And, and I like, you know, even with investigating the afterlife and the paranormal, you want to see some evidence. You want to see some hard evidence. Um, yeah. You know, the sceptics will tear you, tear you apart otherwise. Hmm. Um, now, if... There's so many different theories as to what happened or didn't happen. But I think a lot of people miss the point. If you listen, and I've heard some um, first and second hand accounts from people that lived near Rendlesham Forest, and if you listen to what they're saying, it blows a lot of the sceptics' theories out of the water as what they're saying the Rendlesham event was, mm. um, whether it's a down satellite or whatever. There's, there's so many different theories. Um, what I find interesting, and again, it was something that was on YouTube, and I can't find it now, um, whether it's been taken down or, or I don't know, but two of the radar operators um, in the last few years, um, they've left the, the Air Force, and whereas before they wouldn't say anything, they have now, they was on a, a news program, and not only did they track the object on radar, they also saw it with their own eyes. Mm which blows lots of all the other theories out of the water. You know, either they are blatantly lying. Um, <clears throat> why would they? Um, they're putting their credibility, you know, their careers of all their service on the line. Um, they know what they saw. Um, and they've been interviewed on a news program. And they are categorically certain of what they saw and tracked on radar. Mm. And it was not, in their minds, man-made. Hmm. so do, do i believe it happened <clears throat> i wasn't there i can't say for certain something happened um and i would rather listen to if you like not the main players because some of their stories have changed over the years um and have been uh expanded as we know from the books that have come out so what was uh just a uh, a UFO sighting or something in the forest is now a much bigger story that never been mentioned before, which is a bit odd. Um, but yeah, those, those guys swear blind as to what they've seen and you have to go by their testimony. And if you add in the radar operators, the local witnesses, something odd did happen there. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Something very odd. No, I, tend, I tend to agree with you. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, as you know, I mean, Colonel Holt's a good friend of mine. He's um, he stayed at my home a couple of times, and even he says he doesn't know what he's what he saw. But I do, I, I do agree with you that I think even his story's kind of expanded a little bit over the years. Um, 
yeah, it's not something I want to criticise him about, but maybe it's something that you can get like false memories and sometimes things can change in your mind over the years and you can sort of enhance something without even realising it, maybe. I don't know. Um, whether he's done it consciously well, or sub- or unconsciously, I don't know. Yeah, let me let me tell you about eyewitness reports. I, if you take this as a case study, um, quite a few years ago, before Chinese lanterns were flooded in the marketplace, um, the company yeah. was was um, one of the first importers, mm. and they phoned me up and they said, um, "We're going to be doing some local testing over a town called Whitford." We're going to be laying off some of these these new things called Chinese lanterns that we've imported. Oh, okay, fine. They said you might get a couple of reports of people that are seeing them. Well, a couple of reports was a bit of an understatement. My phone was going <laughs> non-stop. And to be honest, it got really irritating. So I went over there and I was I did it just purely out of a out of an experiment more than anything else, just to see how people I know I know I I already known what they'd, they'd seen because I knew about these Chinese lanterns. Mm. Um, so I knew what they saw um, I've gone over there there was some video footage there was many many eyewitness reports but what was interesting is how their description of what they saw differed but they all saw the same thing mm. Chinese lantern but some of the reports were I, uh, as an example one, one eyewitness said I saw this UFO or this a few UFOs being chased by this military jet. And I'm thinking, no, you didn't. <laughs> you didn't have, because they're Chinese lanterns. But he he didn't know that I knew this, you see. So it just it did make me wonder that if the eyewitness reports, and obviously I knew I, I knew what they'd seen, as did a few others, but how they exaggerated and describe what they'd seen and how different it was to the next person who lived just down the street was quite frightening because when you think how much um, legally, how much eyewitness testimony is taken in a court, um, and yet if you listen to these people that have all seen the same thing, but it, they varied so widely as to how many, the colours, the speed, um, and it was quite a, a bit of a reality check that, you know, people go to prison based on eyewitness, eyewitness mm, testimony. Mm. You think, based on this sample group of people who I know what they saw, but the way they described what they saw was quite interesting because it varied so much and so wildly. And um, funny enough, the, 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 the Chinese lanterns uh, phone calls were just getting ridiculous. And I was, you know, picking up the phone, I'd just take the details and be courteous and everything. And uh, and, I'd lo- and I logged it. <clears throat> and then one day, it was getting quite late, and this guy phoned up and he said, uh, I want to report a UFO site. And I thought, oh, not again. <laughs> I said, whereabouts in Wickford do you live? And he said, I don't live in Wickford. He said, I live in uh, Great Wakery, which is where I lived. So I thought, well, that's a bit odd. I thought, sure, one can't fly from Wickford. These Chinese lands, they usually come down within a few minutes. Yeah, so set, uh, set fire to fields and things. Yeah, they do, yeah. And... Um, so he said, I live in um, Seaview Drive, which is the road that runs parallel to mine. Mm. I thought, I said, what, do you, what have you seen? And he said, well, my son was looking out of his bedroom window and his bedroom, basically where I'll, I'll bring up Fowness again. Before you get to Fowness, there's a big chunk of uh, farmland and my house is quite close to it. <clears throat> but this guy's son's bedroom overlooked these fields and on the back of these fields was the Thames Estuary. And he said he's filmed this white ball of light uh, zipping about above the, the, the farmer's fields. I said, oh, that's interesting. I said, uh, uh, could, could you uh, bring it round? He said, yeah, yeah, so I'll bring it round now. Literally, within four minutes, I think he walked through the alleyway and he was at my house showing me the shoe pack footage. He said, I've taken it to the police. I said, yeah. He said, they said it's a police helicopter. But you could clearly see, unless there's some kind of turbo now in police helicopters, that meant they could move at right angles and zip around the sky. It obviously was not the police helicopter. And he said to the policeman, he said, uh, he said, well, he said, um, so your this this was your helicopter. Was it up in the sky last night? And the guy had admitted that it wasn't in the sky last night and it wasn't a police helicopter. But they just showed they treated it with a bit of a, a bit of a joke and just tried to get rid of him. 
So again, it was a ball of light that was very, very similar to what was seen, what I described earlier over Hanningfield, white ball of light, making ridiculous uh, turns, defying you know, any kind of maneuvers that conventional or known craft, who knows what the military have got, um, and, it, and he called it on, on camera, on film. That was, was probably one of the best bits of, of evidence. Um, but because I live around the corner, probably about three months later, I was coming home from work and there was quite a bit of uh, frost and a little bit of snow left, the remnants of snow, so going extremely slow. <clears throat> and the bottom of this road before I turned left is the MOD uh, fence, um, which um, the farmer's field is on the other side. So the, basically the MOD had a kind of road that led so they could sec uh, have security going around the perimeter. And there was a, quite a large white ball of light there. And the first thing I thought was, oh, police helicopter must be, must be up in the sky. And then as I'm driving down the road, still quite slowly to get to my turn in, it's like, well, that has moved as I'm driving down here. Helicopters, you know, the cameraman, you know, in the sky and stay still for a while, but not, not that still. And in my mind, I just thought to myself, well, look, I'm, I'm tired, hard day's work, day at work, and I'm, I'm just going to go home. At that point, it just jumped a huge portion of sky at a speed that was just incredible. But that obviously stopped me from turning left, and I was just looking up in the, at the sky and trying to think of every rational explanation that could account for an object that's sitting motionless in the sky, jumps a huge portion of sky, and then just sits there again. So I'm watching this white uh, ball of light, and again, it was over the field that the guy who came come around my house his son had filmed okay um so i'm watching it for about seven or eight seconds and so what 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 could do that you know every you've got to think of every kind of rational explanation and as i'm watching this ball of light it's literally made a zigzag in front of my literally over the field and gone straight up into space it's completely clear night and i actually couldn't couldn't move at first it's like that it was so mind-blowing it was so outside of the box. And when you try and uh, portion a logical explanation to something, and it does something like that, um, <clears throat> that was just beyond odd, beyond weird. Um, and the good thing is the guy um, has footage, which we've still got a copy of, um, that his son was going to delete incidentally because he made a joke of it. Um, and it's good when you get stuff like that tie up, you know, mm. Um, but that that was over uh, Great Wakefield, and I'm, I'm sure there's still stuff being seen around there to this day. Um, but that was quite an interesting one. Yeah, fascinating. Hmm. So, tell me, Mark, what do you think these UFOs? Or where do you think they originate? What, what's 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 in your mind about them? That's the million dollar question. Um, I know, I know. It, it's something that we we've all got our own ideas. I I I, I'm, I tend to think along the interdimensional route with a lot of these things that we're seeing now, rather than sort of extraterrestrial. Although I do believe that we've got extra, extraterrestrials as well. But I think a lot of what we see is in, interdimensional. But I don't know what your idea is. Well, <clears throat> I've always said um, I've not seen any nuts and bolts craft. I haven't seen the silver discs. I've seen primarily white balls of light. I've seen orange balls of light. I've seen um, in Wiltshire, the barge in, which is my home to the crop circle uh, uh, makers, people interested in crop circles quite often head down there. I've seen an object that Andy Collins describes in his book, Light Quest, mm. um, which is like a, a golden ball of light that grew in size that had kind of like rays shining off of it. Um, the, the oddest, I suppose the oddest UFO was when I was driving... Um, in Basildon, and there was a dark, like a drum shaped object with a red light, like a dull red light on either side of it. So, if you can imagine a silhouette of a drum, the red ball of dull red light on either side of it, <clears throat> and I actually thought it was um, some kind of test. This is before drones were, were popular because there was an electronics company that had made um, equipment for the army and the air force um, that was nearby. And I thought, well, it's, it's got to be 
something they were testing. And again, this particular area picked up quite a few reports over the years from a place called Gloucester Park. And it's a, it's a small fishing lake there and had reports from fishermen of, of strange lights in the sky um, and um, eerily, eerily silent evenings where one minute you'd hear the insects and foxes yelping and noises and all of a sudden they'd see a UFO and everything had gone quiet. And I've had that from um, UFO witnesses before, that when they've witnessed something, um, everything's gone silent. Mm. You know, in, mm. in, the, in the countryside, um, you, you do hear animals making noises and insects and all that as well. And I actually put this, this sighting down to um, some kind of military equipment test. But when I did a talk at Langdon Spiritualist Church, there was a guy who witnessed the same object uh, because to me it disappeared. I was going around the roundabout and the object disappeared when I'd gone round to have another look, it just disappeared. And he came up with this report, no prompting from me, um, and said, I saw the exact same object fly off at a ridiculous speed um, as I was traveling in a different direction. And it was like, well, that blows my theory on what that was. That was the most unusual UFO that I'd seen. To my mind, I can't say that they're military craft or whether they are nuts and bolts craft. To me, they're, they're some kind of plasma energy that seems to have intelligence. I'm, I'm pretty sure the object that I saw that was um, the, the guy who son captured it on film um, over the, the fields of Bay Waking, I'm pretty sure that that was an interaction because if I'd have turned the corner into my road, I'd never have thought that was anything other than a police helicopter or something like that. But just as I decided to dismiss it is when it moved. And yeah. then, on, as far as I was concerned, the little show. To my mind, they are interdimensional rather than terrestrial. Um, and I think they've been here a long time. <clears throat> I do believe that there is some connection with uh, I've just um, been involved in, I wouldn't say spiritualism, spiritualism. I've been investigating um, the afterlife for nearly as long as I've been investigating UFOs. I do believe there's a, a connection that these beings are maybe us from the future, maybe beings coming through um, some kind of interdimensional window just to come and keep an eye on us and what we're doing. There are so many numerous reports of UFOs uh, interfering with nuclear weapons bases. There's a good documentary, UFOs and nukes, up to one spring to mind, um, that they are here. They have been seen regularly, and I think, throughout history. Uh, to me, I believe in, they are interdimensional rather than extraterrestrial. Mm. So when you hear stories, you know, like Jim Penniston says he touched the craft in Rendlesham, Rebecca Rendlesham again, sorry. Uh, what, do, what do you make of that? Because uh, that was actually a nuts and bolts craft, wasn't it? He uh, sort of felt, well, he says he felt. And I, I, I tend to believe Jim. I've spoken to Jim a lot. And, um, you know, I don't know if you've read his book, have you? Um, Rendlesham Enigma. Oh, yeah, no, no. Well, I would, I would recommend getting that at some point because it's very, very detailed and it goes into a lot of um, the ins and outs and timelines and everything what, to what everyone experienced, who, who was ex who was involved, that is. And it also explains why some people weren't involved, you says they were, and, and why they weren't involved. <laughs> you know, it, it goes into all of that. And, um, yeah, yeah, I just sort of wonder what you felt about that. You said about there's no nuts and bolts um um craft if you want of a better word i mean could that have been a military craft you think an experiment that they but i would have thought being being a military base like that they would have, they would have known about it uh well, that's only that's only my viewpoint from what i've seen and from the investigations i've carried out on on people that have seen ufos and what they've seen in the local areas um including one in in canada which was a diamond um, diamond type light that shone across from one lake side of a lake to another Lake Huron in uh, northern Ontario um, but but I, I can't honestly say I've, I've seen them, I've seen the craft in daylight, I've seen them at night I've seen them with witnesses and 
there's nothing that, that, that suggests they are, I mean, triangles are quite common. We have, I haven't seen any of those. I've had quite a few reports from people that have seen flying triangles, mm. um, and it's quite possible they're military. Penniston, what he saw was a triangular type shaped part. But then you get someone coming out saying, well, they believed it was um, a secret mind control experiment and they were putting those visions, thoughts into their heads. Again, I don't know. I wasn't there. Yeah, I mean, um, it's always a possibility. I'm always open to what those possibilities are. I mean, Jim's convinced he saw something. And, and the fact that they went out the next day and they were measuring um, like the apparently the indentation marks in the ground, obviously, and, and the military were, in, were in, uh, involved in that as well, uh, doing them, those measurements. Um, no, I just wonder what your thoughts were on it, that's all. Well, um, I've, I've not seen anything that's nuts and bolts. And um, if you take the sightings that I've investigated from local people across you know, a reasonable area, and again, they've been primarily either white balls of light, triangles, mm. uh, occasionally uh, red balls of light, but primarily white balls of light. Uh, there's been an awful lot of people that have reported UFOs with white balls of light that are zigzagging around the sky, you know, playing little games, um, if you like, and uh, they've been seen by quite a few people. Yeah. To, as to anything daylight and nuts and bolts, the only report I've I've had was a, um, a lady who didn't want any publicity and only told me the story because um, I got to know her quite well. And she was and she was a youngster in her teenage years. She was with a boyfriend over um, in Kent, not in, on this side of the water. Um, and they both saw a silver classic shaped UFO. It moved, you know, they watched it for about uh, a minute, minute and a half. And then it moved and shot off from one side of this um, countryside over across like 10 fields, and it was just like a dot. Now, what was interesting, she said, mm. and she, she saw this craft when she was in her, her teens, and she was probably in her late 40s when she told me this. Um, and she said, he, her boyfriend, went into denial, and she bumped into him every now and again. And literally, only the, only the last thing he got into his 40s did he admit to seeing what they both saw? All right. That shows how psychologically hmm. some people are not going to be able to accept what is the truth, what is, you know, that there are beings visiting us, um, coming through dimensional portals or coming through, whether you believe the extraterrestrial hypothesis, it, whatever, um, some people are not going to be able to mentally handle the, that fact. Yeah, so they're spending their li- so they're spending their lives lying to it, lying to themselves, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, where do you think the subject's going with UFO stories now being in the mainstream as well? Now uh, we we seem to be hearing quite a lot coming out from the Pentagon and everything. Where do you think? Where do you think we're heading? Do you think we're heading for full disclosure? Well, you know, the, the famous dripping tap of information seems to be dripping faster and faster. Mm. And I think at some point we're going to get a full disclosure. Um, there are now far so, so many witnesses, and the the local, uh, well, not only the local media, the national media are are drip feeding UFO reports near, nearly every day. As soon as they can find a story, they're printing it, mm. um, which seems odd because at one point anyone that saw a UFO, they would literally come out and call them crazy, and you know. They're, they have completely changed their viewpoint and are now happy to run with some at times ridiculous stories to do with UFOs, completely ridiculous. But yeah. it certainly does seem, you know, across the world, the media is taking these objects more seriously and it's become very, very mainstream now. Very mm. mainstream. Of course, if you see something come on, something like the One Show, they'll still have a little giggle about it, though, won't they, about little green men and everything. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. Just to, yeah. sort of, just to put that little bit of ridicule in, even though it's that you've got stuff coming out from the military in the Pentagon and everything else, they still find it funny. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's what I can't yeah. quite get my head around. I mean, it's also, we're hearing stories that um, because of things that are going on, that they could actually do a fake alien invasion. Well, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I, 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 I
yeah, I mean, I've heard that. And, um, and maybe that's what we're building up to, all these UFO reports and stuff, you know. Um, some people would say, well, that's what they're building up to, to this fake alien invasion. Well, it's possible. Um, there certainly seems to be a lot more um, threats and lots of um, more aggressive talk as regards to China and America and America and Russia. And they've now got nuclear weapons that we to think what they could do to the planet. Um, and when you consider that there's been instances of craft that have interfered with um, weapon systems, nuclear weapon systems, in lots of different countries, um, it does make you wonder what, you know, maybe we've been warned, you know, you're, you're not intelligent enough to play with these toys. Yeah. Do you just completely destroy planet? And we also hear about, you mentioned not nuclear weapons. We've also heard in the past that they can um, make our nuclear weapons not work. <laughs> so, so yeah. That could, you yeah. know. Yeah, I think there's going to be, um, you know, the, the documentary UFOs and Nukes has got some great um, information on, on um, how UFOs have interfered in nuclear weapons. Mm. Uh, and I'll tell you what's interesting. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, I've kind of cut across paranormal and um, have done a bit of mediumship in the past um, and there's no doubt that um, if you're in spiritualist circles and you mention something that you psychically see or, or see through using mediumship and it doesn't look quite human as in it looks something that's more non-human it's not kind of overly welcome even though I do know of mediums that see what they consider uh, grey type beings in the spirit world quite regularly. Um, again, another good documentary, the Skull Experiment, um, mm. the Afterlife Investigation, the Skull Experiment on YouTube. They did lots of experiments uh, in the 80s. And one of the things that, that they kind of got a photo of was what we would call quite clearly like a, an energy version of a grey. So that kind of begs the question, what, you know, what are they doing in the spirit world? Um, they shouldn't be there, and, and certainly spiritualists are not overly keen on talking about things like that, um, because that blows uh, some of the principles of spiritualism out of the water. But those that get involved in meditation and mediumship, I think there's more than a few that have, have uh, picked up on, on being, shall we say, that uh, are not normally associated with clairvoyance and mediumship and the afterlife. And maybe that's what happens when we die. I've had far, far more evidence than I could ever wish for as regards to life after death. Um, and maybe you know, our energy just goes into a universal energy pot and there's beings from here, there and everywhere that share the same space. Mm. Maybe down here that um, we're being protected to a certain extent because anyway, you can imagine any time that human beings get um, a bit of technology in their hands, they don't always use it for good. It's been proven throughout history. And, and I think we're too early in, in our development um, to be able to handle suddenly one government coming out and saying they're, they're here, they've been here for a long time. Are they abducting people and um, doing experiments? That's another story. I mean, that's a, a completely different side to the subject. But that may be the reason why. Maybe there's some that are good and have our best intentions, and maybe the others are not so good. And yeah. Not so good and have humanity's best interest at heart. Yeah, I mean, I, I was actually going to talk to you about life after death and all, and um, you've been in, investigating that for, you know, for quite some time. So if we go off the UFO subjects and perhaps go more into the life after death subjects, um, what more can you tell us about that? Well, <clears throat> I got into it um, more to kind of poo-poo it than anything else. Um, I was when I when I was a teenager, I was very much into ESP and, and doing ESP experiments, and I bought a few books and um, you know, did a little bit of mucking about with uh, ESP and, and trying to do a bit of telepathy, all that kind of stuff, and more you know, fun than anything else. Um, and I went along to a spiritualist church. And um, a medium come out with something that I didn't know about. It, my, my theory was that all the mediums were doing was 
were picking up on, on telepathy. I'm just reading people's mind. Mm. Um, but on this particular occasion, um, they gave me some information that I knew nothing about. But um, if someone said to you um, about a relative that had a pet pig in a Victorian kitchen, and I'm I'm standing there thinking you're absolutely fine. You're you know you're going to get taken away. Absolutely, you're mad. And I was just literally poo pooing it as you do when you're a teenager. And as I said to you, I'm I'm, more, I'm quite on the sceptical side of things. And then it's only when I and there was a lot more to, to the description and a lot more info which I won't go into. But then I went home and a couple of weeks later, my dad said to me, um, "Oh, did you go to that uh, spiritualist place on here? Like I was rubbish." And he said, "Why?" So I told it. I told him about pet pig running around the kitchen and he said that's my grandmother you're talking about and i'm like what so that kind of blew my argument yeah, not, not 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 the peak you're talking yeah, <laughs> yeah well, that, that blew my theory on mediumship being telepathy out of the water because mm. the information wasn't in my head so they couldn't have pulled it out from mm. me I, I thought it was a lot of rubbish but as soon as I told my dad what I'd been told, oh yeah, he knew all about it. If he'd have been there, he'd said yes, 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 yes. But wow. didn't mean anything. That blew that argument out of the water, and that kind of sparked my interest into mediumship, which I've started doing on and off for, for about forty years. Um, but I have got information from close family members who I've sat with before they died, who and I've had their words to me and my words to them recounted by a total stranger. That a hall I didn't even know I was going into. So, for me personally, um, you know, with, I've got into all these subjects for, for selfish reasons. And so I wanted answers for myself, let alone mm. anyone else. Well, that's how we all start out, isn't it? Because we want to know. Yeah. yeah. So I've more than had enough evidence for UFOs. More than enough. Do I know where they come from? No, I don't. The afterlife. I've had tons and tons of evidence. Um, I've, I've I've been involved in. Uh, Spiritualist, not spiritualist, the religious side, but in mediumship circles and spoken to mediums, been with mediums, been with friends who've had messages. And um, there's a ton of evidence for it. Now, I think um, if you look at, um, investigate some of the near death experiences, there's quite a few people that come back and a lot of them say the same, same thing. But when we die, we go to another place. We are an energy form, which is probably our true form anyway. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people that, that unfortunately will cling to religious books, but that doesn't give, and I don't think it gives you the answers you need. And there's one thing that's very interesting. I, I, I'm, again, I err very much on the sceptical side, and I find it interesting that when, and I'm a big fan of Darren Brown, um, the kind of uh, magician, and uh, what he does, I've seen him in shows, but he always tends to pick what I call the pub medium, the people that are doing it for a bit of a laugh and a bit of pocket money. He doesn't go to like what I consider the good mediums that get very, very good evidence. Um, and a lot of the best mediums are not famous. They're not on TV. They're just mm. regular halls. They've got no interest in you know, selling out big halls. They just do the local halls. And they, they um, kind of connect with people and give them some astounding evidence. Yeah, they usually just get their expenses paid or something like that, don't they? I think they get a bit of a bit of petrol money and uh, yeah, that's it. you know, a bit of appearance money, but it's you know, for, for a cold Sunday night when they go out, some of them travel miles, you think, mm. you know, you're doing it for the love of it, not because you know, and earning a few a few quid on top of petrol money, but they're doing it because, you know, a lot of them consider it it's it, to give someone evidence that a loved one is is still around is quite comforting. And um, it's got a lot of people's minds at but I think what is interesting, whenever I, you know, I, I do find myself laughing now when you say that these murderers do think they've got away with murder, and, and I think, no, 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 you've got a big shot coming. You've got a big shot coming. On the, you know, not for any God connection or anything like that, but you know, there is no end as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, and I think it all ties up. A lot of people that are into uh, UFOs quite often, you, you meet them and they've got an interest in mediumship or, or, or clairvoyance or psychic you know, interests. Um, and I don't think that's a coincidence. No, I've said that to you before, that I, I couldn't see connections between UFOs and 
spiritualism and ghosts and all that sort of thing. But over the last few years, maybe after the last sort of maybe maybe over the last ten years, I'm beginning to start seeing a lot, quite a lot of connections between. Um, and I think a lot of it again comes into like the dimensional thing, doesn't it, Mark? I don't know if that's, uh, that's how you feel, see about it, you know. Well, when, well yeah, we kind of just cross into another dimension when we die, and it's kind of yeah. a bit like that. The only thing that worries me slightly is that we're part of some super intelligent AI computer game, mm -hmm. like a, a super advanced mm -hmm. simulator. And if you look at uh, some of the quantum physicists on YouTube and some of some of the guys on there and what they're saying, and it's like, well, they're not convinced we're not some kind of super intelligent generated computer game. Yeah, um, yeah. It, that, it does. It's quite a scary thought to be honest. <clears throat> Well, well, David Icke has said something similar, hasn't he? Being a block, you know, living in a, in a matrix type world. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's you know, and it's very it's very difficult to get your head around. But when you start thinking about quantum physics, I mean, I don't know anything about quantum physics. But when you start thinking about the molecules and atoms and things like that, it's nothing ever nothing solid. You know, you can start. You can kind of start see. You can't you get a little bit of understanding as to where they're coming from. You know. Yeah, well, I was, I was at the Science Museum um, one day. I took the, uh, the kids to the Science Museum, and they were doing an experiment with virtual reality, you know, the, the glasses that you put on and everything. And mm. what they wanted uh, volunteers to do, and it's only because, you know, I thought it'd be interesting for like half an hour, um, just to see what it was like. And I've got to be honest, they, they set up three different virtual worlds and they wanted to test your reaction. So you had to press a button if you were scared or you know, whatever. So you had to give it your reaction to what was like a, a, a kind of like planet scene with a strange creature running around, um, a, like a horror scene with a, a haunted house with spiders coming down the walls, that kind of thing. And uh, oh, yeah, the other one was like an office and boring as anything. So you had to give your reaction to it. And I must admit, when I was into, I was in the, like, the kind of made-up world, like an alien world, it was, I didn't want to come out of it. And um, and I, I could have happily stayed in there. And when I finished the experiment, I got talking to a couple of people that were conducting the experiment. And I said, uh, I said, oh, that's fantastic. I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to explore the alien world. I didn't want to come back. And she said, we've had to, for the general public, tone down and make it as simplistic and not realistic as possible. She said, because the new, what's coming in the future, is going to be so realistic, people won't want to come out of it. And I could completely get it. I could say, yeah, I wanted to stay there and go exploring and you know, find what other creatures are there and just go wandering through this alien world. Now, if you imagine how advanced these VR realities are going to be where you can just plug yourself in in the future. Imagine what they're going to be like in a thousand years or mm, five hundred years. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And you can imagine what we're in now could be created. If we've survived another thousand years, but let's have a story. Yeah. No, no, it certainly won't be us, that's for sure. Unless you come back, you never know. Yeah. Oh, no, I didn't mean us. I meant the planet as a, as a, as a, as a planet, oh, as a world. You know, well, yeah. but um, yeah, but you're right. I mean, just imagine how you know where we are now. I mean, because stuff's amazing now. But it's like you say, imagine it in another thousand years. It will be like, like it'll be like worlds within worlds, won't it? And you could be like a matrix within a matrix. Exactly. And it's, it's quite an amazing thought. You know, I actually thought about that to be honest. Yeah, we just we just don't know how. When you think how far we've come, mm. computers in since the sixties. Yeah, I remember the little tennis game we had yeah. <laughs> when I first did. How, how amazing that was. And that, that that wasn't all that long ago. Well, it might be, well, well, well I suppose 35 years ago or something, but uh, yeah. it, it doesn't seem that long ago. But it's advancing so much that, yeah, yeah it, it, as long as we, we pass the basic tests, that's probably any intelligent or any intelligent species, you know, if we don't blow ourselves up um, in the meantime. We've still got countries touring around with threatening each other with armies and nuclear weapons. And that may be, that may be why we're being watched. You know, maybe it's like a, you know, um, super advanced species. This is what happens when, um, 
beings get to a certain level of intelligence and it's either sink or swim we're going to yeah. have a fantastic future with new technologies or may, maybe we destroy ourselves that, a lot of scientists believe that as well yeah I mean that would be another reason why we could be getting um, visited from another dimension as well because um, whatever we do on our dimension it could very well affect somebody else's dimension couldn't it because we're all on the same reality more or less possibly, yeah. you know and that could be why yeah. they feel yeah. that Quite we're possibly. a threat I mean, you know but um hi, what's been your best bit of evidence do you think for the after life after death i mean do you believe in like reincarnation and stuff like that have you, have you had any experiences of it uh, I've I've done I've, I've, I've been hypnotised, which is not always uh, reliable. Um, as anyone that's involved in the past life regression will tell you that if you, the mind can relay stories of books that you've read when you were mm, uh, yeah. a youngster and, and relay them as actually happening to you. So you've got to be a little bit careful. I know. I know. Um, and there's also so, quite, so many movies um, we've had implanted into, into our heads as well, don't we, over the years, where yeah. where you can go, yeah. you've got so much stuff buzzing around in your head, you don't know if you're making it up or not. I've had that experience. Sorry, I'll interrupt well, you. The, <laughs> yeah, no, the one that, the one that uh, I, I, I've had past life regression a few times, the one that stands out was um, one where I was uh, uh, in a First World War train. And I've gone over the top, and the next minute I'm lying in mud, caked in mud and water. Looking, and um, what was interesting about that one was I knew that I'd been injured from the waist down um, because I, I knew leg was missing or something something bad was um, had happened to me. Um, because there was just an explosion and the next minute I'm looking up, looking at the stars. All of a sudden, everything has got extremely bright, like an all enveloping white light. And as this past life aggressionist is asking me all these questions, he must have seen a, look, a puzzled look on my face. And he said, what's the matter? And I said, well, there's, there's guys coming out of this light and they're helping everyone up from the battlefield. And he said, well, why are you puzzled? He said, and I remember saying to him, because these are guys that have died and their boots are not sinking into the mud. They're spotlessly clean. Whereas it was it was just a mud pit, everywhere was a mud pit. So these two guys that in, in that life I knew had died, helped me up and guided me towards this egg, this oval light. And there was an old lady um, standing there, quite a... a largest lady with a big grin on her face with her arms outstretched and the past life regression said to me um who's who's the lady and now in my mind i was thinking I haven't got clue yet my voice said that's my granny as in my grandmother and she just took hold of my arms and guided me through the white light um and that was it it just finished then so i feel actually quite lucky that um I, I went through that experience, but one thing that was interesting was, was that a past life, or did I just click into a mediumship form, vibration, and it was someone else's life who showed me how they died, so mm. I don't know. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it, there is a, I, I, know, I know exactly what you, what you so mean. What, what was the weirdest thing is when the past life regression had been asked about the lady, said, who is it? And, and my mind is saying, I haven't got a clue, no idea. And out of my mouth comes it McGranny in a northern accent. And that was quite <laughs> wow, where's that come from? Mm. Um, she just held out her arms and took me through this this like portal of, of light, and that was it. I'll tell you what, some of the things that really amazed me is when someone comes out and starts talking um like ancient Chinese, you know, a dead language or something like that. I mean, how does that happen? It's actually, you know, you'd think that would be impossible, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's some people that have. Um, well, I mean, to me, to, to me, that's that, that's piano. actual. To me, that's hard evidence of life after death and, and reincarnation and somebody coming back. Would you see it like that? Yeah, yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah. You I know, think. I, I mean, what else could it be but hard evidence? 
yeah, I mean, if, if, um, if you know, a lot of a lot of the past life regression stuff, you've got to be a little bit careful because they, you know, you said you can relay stories going back mm. years, but I, I'm sure there's still people that relay information that they can't possibly have known. Um, and there's again, there's some quite a few cases of little kids describing being in, in the war, being down by planes, and yeah. being a pilot in a past life. And, and recognise family members of the person who died, even though they were like 50, 60 years ago. Mm, mm. You know, to which how can we know that? Yeah. Yes, you've got to be careful when you talk about there being an after, and um, because people probably don't realise how good it would, was, would want to just jump straight over the other side as soon as some crisis in their life happened. But I do believe you're here to learn lessons, um, and and if you don't learn that lesson, you'll come back. Mm. So you're, you should make use of every day that you're here and enjoy life as much as you can. Bit Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, you've got, while you're here, you've got to learn the lessons that you need to learn. Yeah. Anyway, I'll tell you, we've been, the sound's been bouncing around. I don't know if it's your end or my end, but I think it might be, could be my end. But um, so with, with this South End UFO group, and it's not, it's not just UFO group, is it? It's kind of a paranormal thing. So um, do, you, do you think it'll be in a new year or be kicking off again? Yeah, I think we're going to um, start our um, <clears throat> uh, first meeting of next year, probably end of January. Yeah, you have to give uh, us a shout. I'll definitely, definitely be in on that one. Yeah, well, we're going to have, we're going to have um, people that can come along. Um, we're not going to have a speaker. We're just going to have people talk about their own experiences. And sometimes we've had some fantastic nights where That'd be nice, people, yeah. you know, talked about their UFO sightings, their ghost experience, some maybe poltergeist um, stuff that's happened in their house. Um, and we've got, you know, investigators that can, you know, sort out poltergeist and all that kind of stuff. We've got guys that are very experienced in and some of the stuff they tell you about what they investigate, you might your head stand up, I believe it's pretty yeah. well actually pretty I could uh, I could actually uh, I might think about I could bring a recorder for that and maybe put a show together with all different little experiences, make a lot of collection show type of thing. I'll to, I'll to look into that. Might be interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If people don't mind being on the radio that is. But uh, it sounds like a good idea to me. Anyway, Mark, I guess we, we better leave it there because I was just saying the sound's bouncing around a little bit from here, but it's but I think we've got it does. Um, it's, it's been generally pretty good, I think. But um yeah, it's been great talking to you. Um as I say, I look forward to seeing you again. We'll probably see you tomorrow around the corner or something. But, so we'll have to go out and have a beer again when you're free. We'll drop over to the yacht club if you want. Yeah, I'll get Jill to come this time. For anyone listening to us here, we've got a yacht club just around the corner, which marks a, a member of. And it's really nice. Well, I think uh, we ought to do that. But until then, Mark, thank you very much for coming on. It's been great talking to you. No worries. Cheers, David. All right. Cheers, mate. You Thanks, mate. You take care of yourself. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. Bye, mate. Bye. That was Mark Dalton. Thanks, Mark. Okay, right to close the show, I'd like to wish you all a happy Christmas and I uh, hope you all have a good time. I'll be back with a show just after Christmas. Um, it's going to be a Rendlesham Forest UFO incident special with Monroe Nevels, a very rare interview, which I'm sure you'll find interesting. I'd also like to end this show with um, the, the track I played last week or the last show with from, uh, my friend Tony Moore. It's called Never Gonna Say Goodbye. I've been asked to play it again. So as it's Christmas coming up, this is my present to you. And I hope you enjoy it. It's a lovely song. And it also goes to prove that we never do say goodbye to our lost loved ones. So take care of yourselves and I'll be back after Christmas. Bye-bye. Not gonna say farewell 
I think that you can tell The love is always there You know it's everywhere I'm never gonna say I'm never gonna say I'm never gonna say see you run to me With a face that asks, did I do good? I tell no lies Well, yes, you did wonderfully But comes a time when we must all let go Not gonna say goodbye Not even gonna try you will always be in every memory not gonna say farewell I think that you can tell the love is always there you know it's everywhere not gonna say goodbye not even gonna try cause you will always be Not gonna say farewell I think that you can tell The love is always there You know it's everywhere I'm never gonna say I'm never gonna say I'm never gonna say dimensions is as bright and powerful as our celestial star the sun and although it's expending thousands of pounds of energy every minute of the day have no fear there's plenty left Dimensions is fortnightly on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. They're laughing at you. They're not laughing with you. Fine. I remember my daughter Kerry saying to me, you know, Dad, one day I'm going to be able to walk down Union Street. And I'm going to be able to say, my dad's not mad. Look at what he said. Look at what is happening.
He was right. No so problem. Patient. No, 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 no. Thank you very much. Have a picture of it. Of course, yeah. Which one, that one? Yeah. Who's it for? Yeah, that's Joe. Hey, hey. <laughs> you're my hero. Oh, you're mine. Hey, hey. Brilliant work you're doing. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, it's all yours. <laughs> we love you. Can we get a selfie? Go You're on, so then. amazing. Go on then. <laughs> oh, well, thank so you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. Cheers, mate. I've been following you for years. Keep up Cheers, the good mate. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, mate. But how good does that feel to say that they're not laughing at you now? No, they're not laughing at me now. No, they're not. They're, they're trying to ignore me. The sight of these people um, in these vast numbers um, walking through the London streets saying we're not having it anymore is it's so freaking emotional, you know. You know, I've done some things in my life, but um, you know, this this is this is an incredible day for me to uh, to have seen. Uh, all those years ago, those decades ago, where no one wanted to know and uh, everything you said was crazy, and now you, you see the world waking up on this scale. So, you know, the, the whole COVID um, era has, uh, has been a, a, a fascistic nightmare, but it has woken people up to the fact that um, there are forces running human society that are not the people they see. And we have an opportunity now to... To, to, to turn that, seeing that, into ceasing to cooperate with it. And, and if the kind of numbers we're starting to see cease to cooperate with the dictats of authority and fascism, then the numbers alone mean it cannot prevail. So this is a, a fantastic, pivotal day. And, uh, yeah. and uh, a, a day that gives you enormous encouragement for where we go from here. Hey, hey, how are you, man? Hi. <laughs> Can I get a picture of you? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I love this. Thank you. How the police should be. Stage one, you create a problem. It could be uh, a manufactured virus. You want a reaction and you want them to either say, do something, or you want them to accept what the authorities suggest must be done. So one of the agendas is to massively cull the population. They want to reduce the numbers.